Hello and welcome back to Learning with Luke. It is a two-year journey uh, of studying the entire Gospel of Luke and then the Book of Acts, which was also written by Luke. They're really part one and two of uh, the story of the ministry of Jesus. Part one, the Gospel of Luke, is the story of Jesus' earthly ministry, and part two, the Book of Acts, is the story of his ministry carried out by his body, the church. Um, we have gotten today to a section called the Sermon on the Plain. Um, many Christians are well familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. It is from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's quite lengthy. Um, this is not short today, but we will do it in one reading. Uh, and it is frequently called the Sermon on the Plain because instead of going up a mountain to share uh, this sermon, Jesus comes down to a level place and is uh, with people kind of eye to eye. Um, as I read this for you, and you're going to hear the whole sermon, um, I want you to place yourself in that crowd that when Jesus uh, shared this, when he, he spoke these words. And I want you to monitor your own response and reaction to this. What do you feel as you listen to these words of Jesus? Do you find them exciting? Uh, do you find them challenging? Uh, do you find them a bit off-putting? And I know that's sort of a funny thing to say about the words of Jesus, that how could Jesus' words be off-putting? Let me tell you, um, Jesus can be off-putting at least for me when he says, um, uh, go if go and sell everything, give it to the poor, and follow me. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that. And when he says, anyone who would be my follower must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Again, um, I know what he means. There's something on the one hand very challenging and thrilling about that. And on the other hand, um, it can scare me to death. Um, I think when we take Jesus seriously, we, we do well to... Um, encounter our own feelings about it, because sometimes um, his words are so encouraging and comforting, and sometimes they're really challenging. And so um, I invite you to listen to the word of God as we read from Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 17 and ending in verse 49. Let us listen for the word of God. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And everyone in the crowd was trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For this is how their ancestors treated the prophets." But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. But I say to you who are listening, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you, and if anyone takes what is yours, do not ask for it back again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive payment, 
What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much again. Instead, love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. He also told them a parable. Can the blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into the pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but every disciple who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take the speck in your eye, or let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundations on rock. When a flood arose, the river burst against that house but could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, it quickly collapsed, and great was the ruin of that house. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So there you have it. It's the Sermon on the Plain. It's, it's a bunch of different sayings, and we're going to walk through and look at them. I, I do want to just say one moment about the power of Jesus preaching. It was not on this one, but on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, many of you know my father was a pastor, and one summer when he was serving a church, um, he was doing some kind of fun and experimental things with sermons, and he decided he would memorize the entire Sermon on the Mount. Um, all three chapters, and that would be the sermon that day, to let people hear the entire thing, not just read, but, but, but spoken, kind of orated, if you will. And he didn't do it in big, dramatic fashion. He sat on a stool, um, and he told the congregation what he was doing. No one was surprised, but there was one woman in the congregation who must have been spacing out when he said, these are Jesus' words that I am saying. Because when the service was over, she came up to him and said, oh, pastor, that is the best sermon I have ever heard in my life. You are absolutely masterful, thinking that these were his words. And he had to explain to her, actually, oh, these aren't original to me. Um, but, but there is something powerful about Jesus, whether you love these words I just read or if they're, they're, they're unsettling you. Um, one thing we can certainly say about Jesus, you cannot look away and you cannot turn uh, a deaf ear to him because he is so compelling. Um, he draws us into this experience that is, is really profound. Um, and so, this scene opens up with him coming down to a level place. So this word is going to be spoken person to person. Um, this is very much the human Jesus um, sharing these divine words, person to person, uh, as one uh, human person to other human people. And there's an interesting little line that John, I mean, that Luke, I'm sorry, Luke um, gives at the end of his opening paragraph that gets us ready for some powerful words. He says, and everyone in the crowd was trying to touch him. They were all wanting to be healed for power came out of him and healed all of them. 
This is not just physical healing power Luke is talking about, but this is teaching power that will heal our souls. And so Luke is, is signaling to us what we're about to receive from Jesus is powerful beyond imagination and healing beyond belief. These are words that are not just wise words. Uh, these words are life for us. Uh, and then Jesus begins, and he starts with the Beatitudes, which are different from Luke's, I mean, from Matthew's. Uh, Matthew does not have accompanying woes. Uh, Matthew is just blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Um, but, but Jesus, in, in Luke's gospel, has a number of blessings, and then these kind of accompanying woes. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. I preached about this last Sunday. You can always go back and hear that sermon as well. Um, but it is interesting to note that as Jesus begins this first fleshed out sermon that we're going to hear in Luke's gospel, um, that it begins with the same motifs that were present in Mary's opening song, the Magnificat, where the world's values are turned upside down, the rich are sent empty away, the poor are lifted up, uh, the hungry are filled, the, the, those who are filled are sent away uh, without anything to eat. Um, and that same theme happened in Jesus' opening sermon in Nazareth. Um, when he talked about the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor and sight to the blind, release to the captives, uh, and on and on. And so Luke gets us back into the sermon in the very themes and motifs we've already been developing in his gospel. In fact, it's the only teaching that we have actually had fleshed out so far. Um, and so Luke is situating us back again that God's good news, God's gospel has a particular concern for those who have been pushed to the margins, to those who are oppressed, to those who have been forgotten, to those who have been disinherited and dispossessed. Um, and in one sense, everything that comes after this is going to be an unfolding of this. If that is what's true, if God is is bringing this radical equality, what then is it going to look like? And we have this very ethical sermon that Jesus preaches. Um, when he finishes those woes, he then starts to talk about loving our enemies. Um, and, and this so goes against the grain of both our ethos of our country. Um, you know, you strike our country, we'll strike you back twice as hard. Um, you do something to me, I'll get back at you. Um, our whole legal system, uh, while it is set up to, pr to promote um, freedom and you know, people to, to be able to pursue their own conscience and, um, and protect their property uh, and their life and their livelihood, um, it also can be very contentious. And Jesus, though, here says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. It just, it feels wrong. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Um, and then he goes, I would say, from preaching to meddling, because at least in those you can kind of, well, yeah, I'll pray for those who hate me. I, I don't have to really deal with them, you know, whoever that might be. Um, but then Jesus gets very personal and very direct. If someone strikes you on the cheek, offer them the other cheek. If anyone takes away your coat, give them your shirt as well. Um, Give to everyone who asks. And if anyone takes away what is yours, don't ask for it back. And then he brings in the golden rule, which really kind of messes me up here because I'm already not liking this. Um, and and it's, it's, he's setting up this situation of bad people doing things to me. And then he says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Which means, am I now the one who is taking someone's coat and shirt? Am I the one who's striking someone on the cheek? I mean, Jesus isn't clear about that, but, but he's pushing us deep into this new ethic of how we're going to treat one another, especially those uh, who would harm us or, or um, take advantage of us. It's a very, very uncomfortable idea. And yet this is what Jesus is calling his followers to be about. Um, that in the kingdom of God, it will come about not because um, we build higher fences, because we um, have stronger uh, defensive measures. It will come uh, because we share openly, uh, because we meet people at points of need, 
Um, it's really profound. And then he, he goes into this, um, um, you know, new ethic also, if you love those who love you, what credit does that? Sinners do that. I mean, if you lend and expect something back, what credit is that? I mean, bad people do that all the time. Jesus wants his people. He wants us to differentiate ourselves from the world, not by acting like the world, but by being very different, by showing God's love in different ways. And then he says, um, instead, love your enemies, do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Now, I will confess to you, I do not live that way. Uh, I don't always love my enemies. I don't always do good. And I rarely lend expecting nothing in return. I've got a scorecard in my head, not just of money I've lent people, but of, of ways I've extended myself and that's not come back to me. Um, that's a very human trait to keep score, to bear grudges. Um, and then Jesus says that your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And then he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. So it's not be merciful because God is merciful. Be merciful just as God is merciful. And if you want to know the depth of God's mercy, don't go looking at bad people. We only have to look at ourselves. We do not deserve God's love. We do not deserve the sacrifice God made for us in Jesus Christ. And yet God did not withhold even his only son that we might be reconciled to God. And so Jesus is saying to his followers and saying to the church, our job is not to, um, you know, be nice when it's convenient. It is to be like God. Um, on the one hand, that's impossible. And yet, what would it take for us to begin to approach that? It would take lots of prayer. Um, it takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of self-searching. Um, it takes a lot of encouragement from one another, of modeling that for one another. Um, you know, the church does not always have a great reputation of for kindness, uh, for gentleness with, with each other. Um, I, have, I have been cutting to members of churches that I have been in charge of as a pastor because um, my feelings can get hurt. My temper can run short. I can be tired. I can be having a bad day. There's all kinds of reasons. I'm not getting my way. And Jesus does not just say, well, that's okay because you're human. He calls me and each of us to aspire to something more. And it's going to require something of us. It's going to require that we, we learn from each other and with each other, that we, we practice with each other. It's why we, uh, you know, the passing of the peace um, is a powerful moment where we, we demonstrate reconciliation. It's why I always, um, I always encourage people, don't chit chat during the passing of the peace because this is not a chance to catch up with your friends. This is a chance to say, I've screwed up, you've screwed up, we've hurt each other, and yet in God we are made new and we have a new relationship. It's a powerful, powerful moment uh, and a powerful reality that we need if we are going to be merciful, just as our Father is merciful. Um, and then he talks about don't judge and you will not be judged. Don't condemn, you won't be condemned. Forgive, you'll be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. And in this Sunday's sermon, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. But what's interesting about that statement is Jesus says give and you'll get it back more than you gave. Um, and, and there is this wonderful economy in God's kingdom um, that when we cast our bread upon the waters, uh, when we give with generous hearts, um, blessings return to us in far greater abundance than we could ever give. Um, it's, so we don't do these things um, just because it's like eating Brussels sprouts or something you may not care for, liver or whatever food you don't like, but we've been told is good for us. We do it because we get to participate in God's work, which is a blessing in and of itself, and then in ways we can never fully calculate, uh, but in ways we can receive, we are blessed beyond measure. Um, and so there's there's this, this undercurrent of amazing good news running through this totally different way of living. 
Um, and then he has a couple of parables about the blind leading the blind and um, take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your neighbor's. Um, and I read that and almost every time I hear that passage, I think guilty is charged. Um, it's so easy to be critical of others um, and so easy to excuse what's right in front of me. Um, and so Jesus in this sermon, it is not a just comfy sermon. It's not just, oh, it's okay. Um, he's really challenging us uh, to something profound and something important. And then he talks about trees bearing good fruit and bad fruit. And finally, he talks about the two foundations, the man who built his house on a solid foundation uh, and the man who built a house uh, without a foundation. And in the conclusion in this sermon, what Jesus is suggesting is that the foundation that we build, not just our faith on, but our lives on, are the words of Jesus. On this radical way of being in relationship to God, with those whom we're in close proximity to, because uh, if you're like me, it's easier to be cruel and cutting to the people you know real well because we know their buttons and they know our buttons. Um, but even people who are beyond us, uh, about whom we have fear, um, who we even know are seeking to do us ill, God has called us uh, to a new way of living and a new relationship. And that is the foundation that the church is built on. And so with that foundation, when we look out the window and see people who we don't know, perhaps people we fear, people who look different from us, people who speak differently than us, perhaps people who believe differently than us, Jesus is calling us not to see enemies or others, but to see sisters and brothers. It's a completely different way to see the world and a completely different way to live. And Jesus calls us to nothing less. Amen. Amen.